So back when I was in grade school, don't laugh. Back when I was in grade school, every summer I would go and attend Bible camp for boys. Back then they had girls camp, then they had boys camp. And so each summer I would go, and each time we were there, we anticipated something called follow the leader. And the neat part was, during the day we would take all sorts of hikes. Uh, This was down in northern Arizona, okay? They actually have pine trees in northern Arizona. And our Bible camp was in the pine trees. And so we would take all sorts of hikes during the daytime, but we all looked forward to nighttime because nighttime was when we got to take uh, a night flashlight hike with our cabin leader. And so we looked forward to that. We were anticipating it. It was a lot of fun. You can only imagine what grade school age boys can do at night with flashlights, okay? It was a wild time. But then there was always invariably a night where the leaders were the only ones, the cabin leaders were the only ones permitted to have a flashlight. I mean, no one. Before you left your cabin, I mean, they did like a body search. Uh, They wanted to make sure that no boy had a flashlight So we would take off and we would have to follow our cabin leader wherever he went. He was the only one with a flashlight. And we'd get out there in the middle of the trees. Now, I don't know if anyone in here has ever been in the middle of trees at night. It's like dark. It's like blackness, okay? And it seemed like it was going to be fun at the beginning. And so we were all hyped up, ready to go, ready to do it. And we were faithfully following our cabin leader, who invariably would hold the flashlight down like this. And if you did not stay in line, it was to your own peril. And of course what would happen with grade school age boys at night with no flashlights? I'm here to tell you, there was crying, weeping, and wailing going on. Because, as you would imagine, we boys thought we had it figured out. We knew where our leader was taking us, except we didn't. And pretty soon you'd hear somebody yell, scream, yes, even cry, not me, never did, okay? They... People would wander off. They thought, oh, it's no problem. I can just step over to the side. I can do my own little thing. And pretty soon you would hear somebody out there in the middle of nothing screaming, I can't see! We'd all stop. And we'd have to stand there while our leader would go off looking for the stray sheep. Oh, did I mention it was really black? I thought about that this week as I was getting ready for today. It seems like in our world today, I'm discovering more and more people who are getting off track, not following the leader, in this case, the servant. For you see, even back when I was a grade school age boy, to today, nothing has changed. It seems like we human beings who have a relationship with the leader have this unbelievable tendency. We tend to just go off on our own. And this is why I love the Gospel of Mark. And last week, Pastor Chris set the stage for us. For through this series in Mark, we are not looking at every verse that Mark wrote, but we are looking at the major issue. And Mark presents Jesus as the servant. If you read the Gospel of Mark, 
if you pay attention, you will see how Mark unfolds for us everything pertaining to being a servant. And there's a reason for that. It's because when you and I gave our life to Jesus Christ, and I, I'm taking an assumption here, okay, that many of you in this room this morning, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ like I do. That means that you gave up your life to follow Jesus like I did. And yet, for many of us, we have sometimes lost our way. Now, fortunately, back in those days of Bible camp, they always found the stray person, thankfully. But I'm finding today that in our world, there are many, many people who are losing their way, who are turning aside from staying in step with Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning, and this Jesus thing, you just haven't bought into it yet. And that's okay, I guess. Uh, you do so at your own peril. But I want you to know this morning that my Savior, Jesus Christ, the leader of my life, has changed my life forever. And if you have never experienced that in your personal life, we're going to invite you at the end of this message time that you can join and be a part of the family of Jesus Christ that lasts for all of eternity. And we'll tell you more later about that. But many of you this morning are like I am. You're a follower. And Mark encourages us to follow the servant. Now, in those days as a young boy, I didn't get it all. I was all caught up in the, oh, let's go hiking with no flashlights. You know, who knows where you're going to step and all that stuff. Many of us went home at the end of camp each year with all sorts of bumps and bruises and what have you because it, we just didn't always get it. Stay in line and stay in step with the leader. Today, there are many people, as followers of Jesus Christ, I'm sad to say, many who are stumbling, failing, falling, crashing and burning because of the unwillingness, and that's really the reality here. It isn't by chance. It isn't, oh, I made a mistake. No, when we make a decision to ignore Jesus, to ignore Jesus' counsel, to ignore the principles that Jesus gives us in the Bible, we do so at our own peril. Now, many people as Christians think, and I don't know where we get this, but we think somehow I can, I can crash and burn, I can go my own direction, and Jesus will bring me back. Well, Jesus always goes searching, as we read in the New Testament. Jesus was willing to go anywhere to rescue an individual. But Jesus never rescued anyone who didn't want to be rescued. And I'm wondering today, in our world of Christianity, how many there must be, I, I, I think about this, how many people, maybe right in this room, maybe silently and quietly, you may be one of those. You know that you're off track. You know that you are moving in a direction that you, you really have no business going. But you're going to do it. Because it feels good. It makes you think you're important. You're in charge of yourself. And invariably, Jesus has to come and tap on your heart. Say, hey, I'm still here. And I wonder how many really listen and allow him to get them back on track. Mark has a wonderful way of showing this especially in chapter 3. I love chapter 3. So if you have your Bible in any way, shape, or form, if you're tuning in to us this morning on Facebook Live, I encourage you, look at chapter 3 of Mark. 
I'm going to do the entire chapter this morning. And some of you are going to think to yourself, yeah, right, 35 some verses, right. Are we going to be here until noon? Well, maybe. You don't have any place better to go, do you? Uh, Just remember this. Uh, This won't cost you any extra this morning. We are not doing church. We are church. When you walked in this morning, when I walked in, the church arrived. We just happened to use this place called an auditorium to meet and worship and remind ourselves of how great Jesus is. You remember that song you did a few minutes back that Chris led us in? Fight. This is how I fight. Why didn't you all raise your hand like this with your fist? Okay, on the count of three, this is called group participation. And and you remember this the next time Chris leads us in that song. Because I want to see everybody in this room do this, okay? So on the count of three, I want you to raise your fist and yell, this is how I fight. Are you ready? Are you with me? Oh, come on. It's okay. Those on Facebook, you can do it as loud as you want because nobody's around you, all right? So on the count of three, one, two, three. This is how I fight. Some of you are so good. The rest of you, I just, I I saw some of you. You didn't think I saw you. You went, that's okay. You get a pass. All right. Hey, this is how we are to fight. Follow the servant. You know, the best way, the best way to get yourself off yourself is to get yourself onto others, to look at what others need to see value as Jesus saw value. Now, when Jesus started his ministry, uh, crowds, I mean, it was like instantaneous, okay? In chapter 1, Jesus spoke the first words of his ministry. And Pastor Chris reminded you about that last week in chapter 1. It seemed like from that moment on, as Jesus was doing miracles, in our eyes, miracles, healing people, touching people, speaking to people, His fame just instantly went skyrocketing out of control, all right? And so we pick up the story in chapter 3. Jesus, uh, well, before I get there, I need to tell you, this is the key verse, all right? This This is the verse. This is the verse out of the entire book of Mark that just links everything together. Jesus said, our leader said, Our cabin leader with the flashlight set. Uh, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give. My friend, as I, down through the years of my own personal walk with Jesus, when I grab onto that and really grab onto it, it changes everything for me. When I realized that my life is Jesus, because I gave my life to Jesus many years ago, Galatians 2.20 throbs inside of me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it, it really isn't me, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live by flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is Whoa, that just really gets me going every moment that I think of that and I remind myself of that. So Jesus said, listen, you want to follow the leader, you want to be in line, you want to be in step, you want to be going in a direction that really will be everything that you could ever imagine, do what Jesus does. Jesus was selfless. You say, well, he's Jesus. I mean, come on, he's God. He can do anything. But Jesus said, even you and I can do greater things than he did. And I think a lot of us in the evangelical Christianity forum, we don't buy it. And Jesus said, I came first to serve, and then to give. You know, one of our values here at New Hope, you see it every Sunday 
on your bulletin program. Every Sunday, one of our values is generosity. One of our values is evangelism. One of our values is community. Listen, Jesus lived for community, for generosity, for helping people discover that if they follow him, their life will be changed forever. And that's why that verse is so critically important. I encourage you. I challenge you privately, okay? Just you and me, all right? Just you and me. Memorize that verse. Think about it, okay? So now let's jump into chapter 3, okay? Selfishness always looks outward, not inward. Selflessness. I'm sorry, I said selfishness. Some of you caught that. You're shaking your heads. Yeah, I haven't preached for two weeks, so give me a break, all right? Selflessness, selflessness, getting off of me is always outward, never inward. When I turn inward, and Sheila will tell you, she's here this morning, so you can ask her. Whenever I turn inward, everybody around me knows it. You know, look at the way I thought it was supposed to work. I feel so bad. Nobody suffers like me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right? Yeah, some of you live with that, right? Oh, never mind. That's for another day. All right. So we better get into chapter 3 before I get in trouble. Here we go. Chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus goes to church. Oh, they called it synagogue, but he went to church. Jesus never actively missed out on going to church. Jesus loved going to church. You know that? And one of the first things that happened when Jesus went to church in Mark chapter 3, verse 1, it says he entered the church and a man was there with a withered hand. Whoa. And they watched him. Who are they? Put it down. Religious bigwigs. Religious elite. Those in church who were there to espouse and show themselves as being the ones. You ever gone to church with anyone like that? <laughs> I have. Oh, my. Yeah, but that's for another day, too. Okay? Jesus walks into church, sees this man. And these individuals in church, you know, the leaders, the, the, the so-called spiritual guides and all of that, okay, they watched Jesus, whether he would heal the man on what? Sabbath. Is he going to do something that we have always said you cannot do? You can't minister to anybody when you're in church. That would be like today, when you walked in, somebody would stand there, and I know they didn't, so don't you con me, okay? I know no one said this to you. Now, when you go in there this morning, you are not to minister to anybody. But typically, well, anyway, that's for another day. I'll get off of that. Jesus walks into church, and the first thing he notices is a man, one individual in the crowd who had a physical issue. And Jesus loved to touch people and to heal them. Jesus lived to do that. Jesus died on the cross because of it. Jesus spilled his blood to cure it. And Jesus rose from the dead to confirm it. He is in the business of healing your life problem too often is we aren't interested in how Jesus goes about healing us. So this man is in church. He doesn't know that Jesus is there. He's there to do his weekly thing, okay, like so many people do. Go to church, do the weekly thing, get out of there as quickly as you can, all right? So the man was there, and these people are watching Jesus. Why? So that they might point their finger at him and say, Oh, see? Jesus withdrew from church. 
What happened between Mark chapter 3, verse 2, and Mark chapter 7? Let me tell you what happened. Jesus went up to the man, and he healed him. And the entire church went berserk. You say, I don't see that. Well, it's there, between the lines. Look for it. Actually, it was the leaders in the church who caused the chaos. Jesus did this in church? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love Jesus. He is so cool. Jesus just deflected it. He didn't get all worked up over it. You, you got to read in there, okay? So after church is over, okay, Jesus takes his disciples, the 12 guys, all right, and he withdraws with his disciples to the sea. You have to know geographically that he was in Capernaum at church. And after church, he took his guys and walked down to the Sea of Galilee on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And he goes down there. And the entire town, oh, along with a few of their friends, from Jerusalem and Iudema, Idumea, I'm sorry, Idumea, the Jordan, Tyre, and Sidon. If you look on a Bible map, you can see it's an enormous geographical area surrounding the Sea of Galilee. And people from everywhere, as far south as Jerusalem, followed after Jesus. In fact, it was so great, the crowd, that Jesus told his disciples, hey, get a boat ready. Uh, we may have to get in the boat. He was being crushed, literally crushed. I remember one time I was doing a VBS. I, I think it was in Guatemala, but I, who knows? Anyway, I was somewhere, <laughs> and I was doing VBS, and we were having a great time, and I decided that I wanted all the kids to just come and surround me. Don't ever do that if you get your idea going, thinking that's going to be a really cool thing. It was chaos! I got a little taste of what it must have felt like with all these bodies just crushing in around. Everybody wanted to do high fives and all that good stuff. That's how it was that day. Why? Because they heard that Jesus was there. By the way, I did a little survey for myself. Uh, this is extra credit for you if you want it. Um, the crowd is referred to several different ways in the book of Mark, 82 times in 16 chapters. Crowd is referred to, the whole city, things like that. Jesus was always in crowds, not because he invited them, but because they chased after him. Why? Because he spoke and did things that no other human being ever could. And he spoke truth in a way they had never before heard in church. And so that day Jesus is there, and because of the enormous crowd which had to number in the multiple thousands, Jesus says, get a boat ready. And he told his disciples, let's be on the alert, because they were crushing him. I, I cannot even begin to imagine. I got a little taste of it, but I cannot imagine Jesus, son of God. His fame was so great, people were desperately crawling, knocking each other over just to touch with anticipation that if I just touch him, my life will be changed. Whoa! Have you ever been in a situation where you just felt if Jesus would just let me touch him, my life would be changed? Have you ever had that moment? Listen, you can have that moment at any moment of your life if you're a follower of Jesus. Because Jesus invites you
to allow him to touch you and to fill you with himself. It took me a long time to understand how valuable and great that is. So here's Jesus, the selfless servant, okay? All right. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Have you ever felt so great in need in your own personal life where you just desperately long for the touch of Jesus? These people travel days just to see Jesus. And he told his disciples, get it ready, for many wanted to touch him. Now, before he gets into the boat, you have to read this from verse 10 down to verse 20, okay, for yourself. It's, an, it's, it's a statement that Jesus makes in response to the religious bigwigs who were all standing over to the side watching this unfold. And they made a proclamation to the crowd. No one can do this stuff unless Satan lives in him. Oh, Jesus would have none of that. And in verses 10 to 20, he turns around and he speaks to them. And he just lays it on. Very clear. I hope you take time to read it. (laughs) He said a house divided against itself can't stand. And I'm God. I love it. It's great. So in verse 20, then the word spread and he went home. Where's home? Come on, Bible scholars. Where's home? Nazareth. Okay, just want to get you up to speed. Nazareth. So he leaves the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. He travels down part way. He gets out of the boat and he's going to head home. He's going to walk home to Nazareth, which is a few miles away. Okay. And so he goes home, his hometown. It's his hometown because of Joseph and Mary. Okay. Joseph was from Nazareth, and they had set up home housekeeping back in Nazareth after all that transpired that Matthew speaks about. So they are growing up learning. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He's going home, and the crowd gathered again. They just followed him into Nazareth, somewhere in Nazareth, okay, somewhere. There were so many of them, they couldn't eat. The local grocery store was out of food. They they couldn't find anything. I mean, this was like a small town that is overrun with multiple thousands of people. Suddenly, the population just exploded because Jesus came home. And the Bible tells us, and after... The family heard it. Jesus' family in Nazareth isn't with the crowd. They're at home. Now, you have to understand something about Jesus' family. Yes, I know, Mary, she's supposed to be the most wonderful thing in the world and all of that. Well, she did give birth to Jesus, okay? But I don't mean to spoil anything for people who really think Mary is the epitome of life. She wasn't. She was at home with the rest of the family, and they hear about all the commotion that is going on. And they go out to seize Jesus. They're going to go and get Jesus. Mom, along with brothers and sisters and whoever else is in the family, they're following mom out the door, and mom is going to go and get her son and straighten him out. How many times have you moms wanted to just grab one of us kids and slap us up on the side of the head? That's what Mary was about to do. And they get to where Jesus is and they claim, get this, the whole family 
He's nuts. That is not the original Greek. That's the original American slang. For he is out of his mind. My friend, when you decide you're going to literally let Jesus guide your life, lead your life, and you turn around and you act like Jesus by giving, sharing, meeting needs, there's always going to be someone who's going to say, you're nuts. Especially in this culture. We have so many con artists who have every story known to man. And every one of them have, in their minds, a legitimate need. And you come upon one of them. What do we typically do as human beings? I'm not talking Christians or anything here. I'm just talking being human. We typically skirt, go around, ignore, and turn our back on individuals that are not like us. Let's be honest. But Jesus... Jesus was ministering to every one of those people in some way, shape, or form. And even though his mom and family were there saying, come on, come home, we'll straighten you out, Jesus ignored them. It gets even better, okay? It gets even better. Look at this in, in near the end of the chapter, okay? Once again, later on, uh, he's, he's gone to another place in Nazareth. So mom and the boys and girls must have gone home. They couldn't get him to come. And then later on, he stirs it up again. He's in some building somewhere in Nazareth. And they come once again. you got to read this. It's really cool. So near the end of the chapter, it records, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. They told people on the edge of the crowd because the crowd was so enormous, everybody couldn't get into wherever it was Jesus was inside, okay? And Jesus was teaching and speaking and touching people's lives and his family's on the edge of all of it and they send word. Last Sunday I was uh, with the kids. I had a great time. So I played a game with the younger ones uh, last Sunday and I said a phrase and I whispered it to the first young child next to me and had them whisper it all the way around. You know, you have great kids. Some of you have very highly intelligent kids. Well, all of you do. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, "What about, are you speaking about mine? It was amazing. When it came back around, it was exactly how I said it to the first one. Whoa! Kids are awesome. Okay? So, they whispered through the crowd. Get, get Jesus' attention. Finally, it says. And the crowd was sitting around him. And the crowd says to him, Hey, 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 Jesus, by the way, uh, your family's outside. And they want you to come there. Your mother and your brothers and your sisters, they, they all want you. And here's what Jesus said about the whole thing. I love it. It's so cool. So anti-Christian, okay? Anti-Christian. He says, and who are my mother and my brothers? I don't know them. And looking about those who sat around him, he said, see, right here, this, these people are my mother." my brothers, and my sisters. Really? Jesus, God, said that about his own family? Didn't mean it the way we tend to take it. He wasn't downing his mom and his brothers and sisters. He was speaking the truth. They were interfering with his life. You see, if you're going to serve Jesus... How many distractions do you find popping up in your life? 
If you're really going to follow Jesus, it seems like every morning distractions galore descend upon you if you're like I am. There's always stuff, always things, always people, all this stuff running around that we do to survive. And, you know, unfortunately, so many, so many people get caught up with the distractions. They miss out on accomplishing what Jesus designed them to do. I have to be honest with you. There have been so many times in my personal life where I have missed because I was too distracted. With me. Jesus makes this statement to close out the chapter. For whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, my family, my mother, my father. See, in our form of Christianity today, it is so easy for us to to pretend. I'm just going to be flat out straight. We are so good in our world today of Christianity to pretend. We like to pretend. We play pretend. We have taken a child's fun thing and turned it into a lifestyle. As long as I can pretend, I'm okay. And my friend, I have to be straight with you. I have found in my life, when I fall prey to that, Jesus is not impressed, and he lets me know it. The key is, what do I do about it? We live in a world today, as every generation has, where all of us in this room, all of us, have so much going on in your personal life, my personal life, so much that it is so easy on any given day to ignore Jesus and just go and hope for the best. Ah, my friend. Jesus teaches us a principle that, by the way, we say as a church family, we believe in. Generosity is selfless giving. That simply means Jesus teaches us I get out of myself and give. How generous are we as individuals in this room? Are we generous with our life? We always like to talk about money and time and and, and good deeds and all that. What about your life. I have found rarely does a day go by that I'm not aware of someone who needs me. Ah, but you see, it all starts where you are. I have watched over the years, over the decades, I have watched my own life, I have watched many other lives, and I have watched how we Christians can be so selfless going on trips to other places to serve. We will spend enormous amounts of money to go to other cultures and do things that we would never consider doing Jesus doesn't call us to serve there. He calls us to serve here. 
where I am. And it starts where I am. If I'm a husband, I serve my wife. If I am a wife, I serve my husband. If I'm a father, I serve my family. If I'm a friend, I serve my friends. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I just simply get outside of myself. And this is a mind shift. I was talking to someone the other day, and we were talking about a radical change that takes place. And this person was saying to me, you know, I finally discovered it's a radical change of my mind. I said, oh, yeah, it is. Because your mind dictates your heart. My friend this morning, Jesus set the course. Jesus is holding the flashlight. And Jesus is just simply inviting you and me, follow me. Jesus says it repeatedly throughout his ministry. Follow me. Let me ask you a personal question as we wind up. Pastor Chris is going to come out. We're going to close with a song. Are you selflessly following Jesus? Are you allowing Jesus to call the shots in your life?